was uh, super fun to uh, see Father Chad. I've known Father Chad for uh, quite a while, and it's, uh, it was just a lot of fun to, uh, to be able to, to see him uh, in, uh, in his parish. So that was a lot of fun. Um, what a, speak up. God, let's just, I'll work with this then. For somebody, since I wear hearing aids, I obviously have to uh, respect the uh, need to hear. Um, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do wear hearing aids, so I have no idea what you're hearing. So if I start shrinking, hands are necessary, and uh, let me know. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about Catholic social teaching. And um, I'm aware that I believe Father Chad gave his um, presentation on in the environment, his uh, master's thesis actually, on the environment last time. And then I believe forthcoming, uh, Jorge is going to be giving a presentation on artificial intelligence. So I sort of, I'm sort of going to set this up a bit in light of both of those things. And I should, I should tell you, if you, didn't, if you were unable to attend uh, Father's uh, presentation, I had the privilege of reading his thesis um, a few weeks ago, and I highly recommend it. So uh, if you ask nicely, maybe he'll, uh, he'll forward it to you. And, and if he doesn't, then, then I just got myself in trouble. So uh, there you go. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, begin by sort of just laying out terms. So one of the problems that we tend to have as professors is that um, I've done nothing but basically read and study Catholic social teaching for quite a while. Uh, I've been studying politics, economics, and culture since I was five. I'm like, I'm the ultimate, well, you're a professor, you get to be a nerd, it's one of the things you get, you know, they, you get to the, the PhD and they say, and here's the other nerd uh, certificate. Um, so I'm going to try to make sure that what I'm saying makes some sense. Um, if I start falling, you know, one of the advantages of having children and homeschooling is that we basically are tired all the time. Uh, one of the things that that brings with it is, and you get tired, you start using catchphrases that you and five other people in America know. So if I start saying things that don't make sense, raise your hand and say that doesn't make sense. I, you know, I'm used to classroom dynamics. I'm used to students telling me repeatedly that I don't make sense. That's how I, uh, that's how I go. So if the, what I'm saying doesn't make sense, let me know. Uh, ask questions at any point. I also want to say that I think there's a specific time for Q&A afterwards, but I'm sort of used to a classroom dynamic. Uh, so if you have questions, if you have a thought on something, raise your hand and uh, let's just jump into that. Um, I've been told I need to stay in this little uh, area here for the, for the camera, so I'll try to, to do that. But uh, everything else I'm thinking in terms of classroom dynamics, so hopefully that makes sense. So what I want to do is start by, uh, by differentiating two terms uh, that are uh, uh, tr tr uh, traditionally uh, differentiated. The first is Catholic social teaching. And Catholic social teaching is going to be seen, for example, in papal encyclicals. Um, as Catholics, uh, we have the uh, advantage of having a church, that, of being a member of a church that has thought deeply about what it means to live in the world and has done so from the very beginning. Um, we have Jesus himself tries to say, well, what, how do you interact with Caesar? What do you render unto Caesar? What do you not render unto Caesar? So we've been thinking about this as Catholics for a very long time. Uh, what I'm going to do, so that's Catholic social teaching, and as Catholics we um, are really, um, we, we need to listen carefully and follow these, these teaching principles. Catholic social thought, on the other hand, is basically going to be thinking about what these principles might mean and debating about them. So for example, that would be what I do. Oops, I'm probably making all sorts of noise. That's what I do. So I write about Catholic social teaching, but you know, what I tell my wife notwithstanding, I am not the Pope. And so what that means is that I can give ideas, I make arguments, and I try to interpret what the Pope is saying and what the encyclicals say, but it's sort of, it's not the same thing. So that, does that make sense? The, the social teaching is coming from, is, is from the Pope. Social thought is sort of grappling with that. All right, so let me talk about the history, sort of what's been going on. I'm going to sort of set the stage in light of what Father Chad's thesis is working with and then sort of point ahead a bit to what you're going to be hearing about uh, with regards to artificial intelligence. And I should tell you, this is a super exciting presentation. I'm half inclined to make the trip just to hear it. And then now that I know it's being videotaped, I'm totally going to watch this. Uh, it's, it's, it's very exciting. So modern Catholic social teaching usually is thought to begin roughly around this encyclical called Rerum Novarum. And so this is going to be in the 1800s. And there were a lot of, of uh, deep thinking about what we sh how do we live in the church prior to this. But this is where the Catholic Church said, the Industrial Revolution has hit. 
The nation state is really a major force now in world affairs. How do we as Catholics deal with that? And so the Industrial Revolution was leading to poverty uh, or it was, um, was creating huge amounts of wealth but also had huge income disparities. What does that mean for the working class? And it was really sort of this first attempt to try to grapple with what we would now consider as modern economics, right? These modern economic changes, how do we live in this new way? And so since the 1800s there have been stages where the church has been trying to apply the principles of the faith to changing circumstances. And I want to make sure that you sort of, in traditional Catholic social uh, teaching, that's the way this is usually understood. We believe, as Catholics, that God uh, made us, right, with a nature, and that there, is true, there are true principles that apply across time, right? So there are objective standards of right and wrong. But the big question is always, how do you apply those standards in your specific situation? Does that make sense? And that's, this is why politics, of course, is always so difficult and so complicated, because you have new events that happen. You have new characters on the stage, and things are changing. So the question is, how do you apply the principles to specific situations? That's, that's always the difficulty in politics. All right. So in the uh, handout that I gave you, I have a quote from uh, Thomas Aquinas, famously quoting Aristotle, uh, defining prudence as right reason applied to action. Put another way, prudence applies universal principles to the particular conclusions of practical matters. In other words, prudence is so difficult because it's not just simply taking a principle and like an engineer just applying it. You're having to have wisdom to know which principle to apply in one scenario, in which situation. So let me give you an example. Um, I have a son, a five-year-old son, and I have uh, three daughters currently, right? So my oldest daughter is a, is a very smart little lady, but she's also, and she's always been very amenable. You make an argument to her and she would say, you know what, that makes sense, I'll, I will do that. So as a result, correction of my oldest daughter was very easy, of course, if you had this situation, you immediately know that you are brilliant parents and doing it all right because she would, you would, she would explain it to her and she'd say, yeah, that makes sense, and then we'd do it. Then came our second daughter, and she wasn't quite so amenable. She's a rather strong-willed little lady, and she well, maybe I will, maybe I won't. And then came my son, and it turns out that the success had nothing to do with us as parents. It was all biological. Uh, my son came over and was like, well, maybe I'll listen to you, and then I'll do exactly the same thing all over again. So the question is, well, how do you apply discipline in that scenario, right? The answer is, it requires prudence. In other words, if I punished my son in the same way that I punished my eldest daughter, I would fail because the situation has changed. Does that, does that make some sense? You see how that, like, things change? The question is, how do you apply principles and which principles do you apply? Okay, so what has been discussed with Catholic social teaching over the years? What I'm going to do... Is begin, I'll sort of talk about the, uh, let me give you the general principles. Let's start with the, the principles generally understood. We'll talk about the, how the uh, U.S. bishops now try to interpret it. And then I'm going to give you the big picture again. So we'll see if this works. Uh, I, I think it can. Uh, I just finished a super long paper on this. And it turns out it's really impossible to do this paper in less than a three-hour lecture. So I'm trying to be judicious. We'll see. I'm trying to be prudential. We'll see, we'll see if this works. Um, all right, so according to the catechism, there are four general principles of Catholic social teaching. Um, and you probably, if you've read the catechism, you'll probably remember these. Um, the first and the primary principle is the dignity of human life from conception until natural death. And you've heard this phrase uh, undoubtedly uh, many times, right? The, this is basically the dignity of human life. Human life is inherently dignified regardless of race, uh, regardless of gender, regardless of nationality. There is something God-given uh, um, uh, worth of, worthy of dignity for all of us. That's basically the bedrock for most traditional Catholic social teaching. And we're going to talk about how that's changing in a minute, but um, that's the bedrock. That's where it starts. The second principle is that individuals should pursue the common good. Catholic social teaching does not believe in what we would call an atomistic approach to life. Right? 
Catholic social teaching says that life makes sense in community, right? Pope Francis has said, it is notable, he says, that the description of heaven is as a city where we live together, right? This isn't sort of a lone ranger approach to life, you know, it's uh, me and Jesus going on the way. No, Catholic social teaching says it's with families, it's with the greater good, it's with the common good. It's not something you do on your own. Does that, does that make some sense? So that's going to be the common good, what we have in general. The last two principles, uh, I'm going to just play it up as a partisan nature here. They're both, Catholics hold to both of these principles, but political, at least American political conservatives, tend to focus on one, and American traditional, more progressives, tend to focus on the other, right? They, Catholics hold to both of these, but this generally is how it plays out. So, the, let's see where I'm at. I'm going to go to... Um, uh, the third is called uh, duties, well, the, um, it's called subsidiarity. For those of you that are familiar with subsidiarity, that's the third principle, which I'll explain here. Subsidiarity says that rights and duties should apply at the appropriate level, right? Which sounds theoretical, and all of a sudden I'm starting to lose you. It's very practical, right? The question is, what rights and what duties apply at what level? Right? Now, how many of you are familiar with subsidiarity? I don't want to, to, to do that. No? Okay, all right. Um, so this is, based, this is a really, really important principle, right? And conservatives tend to like this because it stresses the importance of keeping things at a lower level, right? In other words, the fa there are things that the family has given both the right and the duty to do, and the state should not intrude upon those. Right? So that would be where principles like religious liberty are very important. God has given us religious liberty rights uh, as a family, parental rights, these sort of things. So does that, does that make some sense? There are some things that are given to the church that are not intended to be given to the state. There are things that are given to local communities that are not intended to be given to national communities, that sort of thing. However, Subsidiarity also says that it's the right of the nation to protect or the responsibility of the nation or the governing uh, regime to protect these lower things. So for what that means is that the family, if you're familiar with, I'm not going to go into Hegel, um, the family has its own uh, being that does not come directly from, say, the state. In other words, the state does not create the family. The family exists on its own. But the state is responsible for protecting the family. So do you see how that works? It's, the, it's sort of this interconnect, interconnected picture of rights and responsibilities, where you have national governments, that are, or you have the regime, you have political regimes that are protecting the family, but do not establish it. So does that, you see that, that difference? So that's, that's going to be subsidiarity. The fourth principle is the principle that traditional American progressives tend to stress more strongly, and that's going to be solidarity. Solidarity is what is it that we have in common with others. Now, I would actually argue that I think both subsidiarity and solidarity are basically two sides of the same coin. Um, I think if you only stress one of those things, then you get into big trouble, um, and they actually fit. So, for example, I am responsible to do things for my wife because we are in the same family, right? We have duties and responsibilities that come together because we are one in that way. But I have different responsibilities to my students, right? My students will want to take up a lot of time, but I can tell them, no, you know, I treat my children differently than I treat my students. They, my children can demand more of me. Why? Because there's this fellow feeling, there's this oneness that we have but there are also different kinds. So does that make sense? So there's a solidarity, but there are different kinds of solidarity that you, would, that you see, right? Your, your sister, your brother, has the ability to demand things of you that perhaps your friends cannot. And, you know, in a good functioning, well-functioning family, your mother has the ability to demand things of you, right, that other people cannot. It's the same sort of thing. Um, and just as a side note, this is one of the things that we've also, we've also begin to, um, um, to see with regards to the environmental, um, a lot of environmental analysis now, right, is this appreciation for this deeper solidarity that we as human beings have, not just in terms of sort of overseeing 
nature, but also recognizing that we are natural ourselves, and therefore there is a deeper solidarity that you can find in terms of being of environmental protection and so forth. And that's, of course, what Pope Francis has been very concerned about lately. Um, it's worth noting that Pope Francis's work is uh, it's, uh, sort of uh, taking new grounds, if you will, in this, but it's not out of nothing. Right? Um, uh, previous popes have also discussed this, uh, particularly Pope Benedict also touched, started touching on this, and Francis is sort of building on that, on that um, work. Does that make sense so far? So those are going to be the four general big principles that you see in Catholic social teaching. What I want to do now is sort of go to the bishops conference. The bishops love to, uh, to multiply words upon words. And so uh, they have taken four principles and they have made seven themes out of it, right? Which is almost, you know, a doubling, but, but not quite. So, um, so I'll, I'll mention these seven and then I'm going to talk sort of uh, about the, sort of what this means in terms of our lives. So I'll, I'll try to set this up. We'll see if I can pull it off. Uh, so the bishops have, uh, their, their seven themes include the life and dignity of the human person, which obviously can play a role particularly in terms of including some of the issues we would have with immigration uh, issues, right? Immigration is a very complicated topic, which I'm not going to quite get into, but I will say that you do see this concern that whether it's uh, the unborn, whether it's uh, our immigrant populations, uh, whatever these groups are, there should be an appreciation for the life and dignity of the human person. Whatever the policies are, you always have to recognize the dignity of the people, born or unborn, young or old, that you're working with. So that's the first, uh, the first principle. Uh, call to family, community, and participation. This is also a really interesting, actually, uh, principle that the bishops have developed. What they're talking about here is the necessity of what we would call associational rights. One of the things that I, per I'm a political scientist, right? I'm a political junkie, I love politics. I've done nothing but study politics since I'm five, since I was five years old, I love politics. If your fundamental identity comes from your partisan affiliation, you are not going to be in a good spiritual place, right? That just never works. I don't care if your hero is Obama or Trump or Pelosi or McConnell, right? That is not a recipe for spiritual success. Right? Why? Because our most meaningful relationships are almost always going to be with those who are close to us. That's where you see face to face. This is one of the things Pope Francis has also talked about. The benefits of seeing people, interacting with people, face to face, right? Um, that's where you get more meaningful relationships. And of course, in the church, we would expect and hope and pray that those relationships would really flourish uh, in the church setting. Um, Based on the number of ministries that uh, Father Chad mentioned in today's service, it sounds like you guys are doing quite well uh, in this regard at this parish. So that would be an example. You're sort of building relationships, building community. Uh, rights and responsibilities, uh, option for the poor and the vulnerable. Uh, the Catholic Church has traditionally been very concerned about the vulnerable. The, the, the theory has always been that the politically connected generally do quite well for themselves in terms of their politics. So the concern would be those who do not have political power, those who are out of power. What, how do we help protect them? Uh, the dignity of work and the rights of the workers, solidarity, which I've already talked about, and care for God's creation. Uh, and then uh, subsidiarity is included as a subcategory under rights and responsibilities. Okay, does that make sense so far? This is sort of like, this is like a, I'm always dangerous, right? This is a dangerous thing, because I'm a political scientist, I've got lists, and then it's late at night. Uh, and so even those of you who do not have children and have been consistently sleeping through the night, uh, this is always a dangerous time, you know, uh, I'm starting to fade out on me. So uh, any questions so far? Does that, make, does that make sense so far? Okay, all right. So what I want to do now is let's talk about, um, so that's the big picture. Let's talk about the stages of the issues over time that Catholic social teaching has grappled with. So that'll give you, I've talked about sort of general theories Let's talk about the specific issues over time that have come up. Remember I said that you have principles that are applied to specific situations, right? And those si specific situations can oftentimes change and usually do change over time, right? Um, if you're in law, one of the funny things to do is you just look back at like the laws that were being uh, passed in early 1900s. 
we currently today don't have too many issues with cars beeping and frightening horses. But it was a huge issue when cars started driving. So they passed all of these laws about how are you going to resolve with cars and horses on the same road. Well, we don't have that issue anymore. And so what issues do we have? So what I'm going to do is talk about the issues over time that we've seen Catholic social teaching work with. The first one that we really saw right off the bat from Rerum Navarum was the question of um, property rights, which would, uh, for those who already have property, and then rights for the workers, for those who would be in particularly vulnerable positions. Um, we're in the West Coast. Um, and I'm sure you've seen, and it's not just the West Coast actually, some of the most horrific stories came from uh, West Virginia. You guys have seen the stories about what it was like for coal miners. Uh, in the, uh, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s. They had these little, these little boys, right, what, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, who were basically going down and working in the coal mines. And they would be starting off doing these jobs, you know, trying to pick the coal out from these, um, from uh, the, the, they were basically were all coming through, and they would, they, had to, they would lose arms, right? It was super dangerous, they could die. Well, that would be, an ex these boys didn't really have any other options, right? So that would be an example of what the early Industrial Revolution was working with. You had basically people who realized they could treat humans as uh, means instead of ends. And so as a result, you know, you could just easily use children in a very half-hearted way. Why? Well, if one dies, there's always another one that you could get just as easily. Does that make sense? So early Industrial Revolution, you see people really beginning to grapple with this. And there's a lot of economic reasons for this, by the way. Um, you see people moving. Initially, you would have more of a feudal scenario where you would have basically, I would be the owner of this land. I would have people who would be working on my lands. And in some sense, they could, inter they could make claims on me, right? And so if you go back, for example, to the medieval ages, right, uh, particularly when there would be uh, Eucharist given you know, once or twice a year, if, I, if you were on my land and I hadn't been treating you right, right, I'm in line for the Eucharist, you could come, at least in England, you could come and say, this man has wronged me, and I would get pulled out of line, and because I was, I had, there was a fault, there was a problem here. In other words, you could keep me from receiving the Eucharist when it was only done once or twice a year, right? Why? Because there was responsibilities, there was long-term commitments. Does that make sense? The idea was, I was going to see you, we were going to be together for a long time. There were still, obviously, major crises, it was not an economically uh, uh, successful solution in the long term, but there was this sense of responsibility. Does that, does that make sense? With the Industrial Revolution, a lot of that sense of responsibility starts to fade away, and I begin to use more short-term labor. Now, there are a lot of economic reasons to go into that changes, and one of my degrees is economics. I'd love to talk with you about it. Um, so there are reasons for that transition, but it also meant that I, as a factory owner, may or may not have cared about the good of my employees, right? So many did. But many could also just view this as, you know, well, you know, if you get hurt, fine. I'm not going to upgrade my, my uh, factory machine when I can just get a new person instead, right? So that, that's one of the big issues you see the early Catholic social teaching working with, or working with. You begin to see, going a little bit further in time, there's a concern, for example, about what you do about the structure of ownership. And the Catholic Church begins to try to play around with questions about how do you give workers a voice uh, within their, uh, within their, uh, their uh, employment. And jumping way ahead, uh, you begin to see uh, with the rise of especially some of the social issues, uh, such as abortion and uh, euthanasia beginning to pop up, the Catholic Church begins to be very, the popes begin to be very concerned about this, right? Uh, uh, Pope John Paul II was, of course, very uh, aggressive on this. The concern was, how do you resolve technology in light of the human person? And this is where I'm just going to point to the lecture you're going to be getting further on down the road. The Catholic Church has always had a very philosophic sort of grappling with technology, right? The church has often, has usually argued, technology can be very helpful for us, but technology can also be very dangerous, right? Particularly if technology allows us to cease viewing humans as ends and begin thinking of them in terms of means. Now, this is, there's a whole branch of philosophy that talks about this, right? Where the thinking is technology can change, has the possibility of changing how I view everyone else. 
Or to put it differently, right, your phone can become just another tool, right, in the same way that I now begin to think of other people as tools for my own manipulation. Does that make sense? And that has been a concern that the Catholic Church has had since the Industrial Revolution. The Church has been very concerned that technology could change how we view the human being itself, right? Himself, not him, him, himself or herself, right? That is something that the Church has been worried about for a long time, which is why the Church is so interested in artificial intelligence. What does that mean for us, particularly what does that mean for how we view ourselves? And that is the reason, I'm sort of going to go back to what I said at the beginning. The reason that's such a big deal is because all of Catholic social teaching is built on, is one of the primary building blocks of this is the dignity of the human person. What does artificial intelligence suggest about how we think about the human person? That's why this is such an important, important discussion. Um, and that's why you should all definitely attend the, uh, the next lecture on this one. This is going to be a super, super important lecture. This is basically the cutting edge of Catholic social teaching. How do you resolve that issue, right? Especially when people are beginning to change their perception of human beings based on their perception of artificial intelligence. Now, this is oftentimes coming from people who don't necessarily know about artificial intelligence, so I will say that. But, but the perception of that can definitely be, it's a big deal. So let me just sort of, that's very theoretical. Let me take it back and sort of give you a specific example of how this works. Um, I'm going to tie together several of the bishop's themes and then root it in that question of the human dignity. So I've taught uh, in classrooms for, since 2002. And one of the most interesting changes that I have seen is what happens when I walk into the room what are students doing? And when I first started teaching, students were always doing the same thing. They would be sitting in their, pew, in their pews, in their, uh, in their chairs, talking with each other, face to face, right? Meeting people that they did not already know, right? This was a classmate maybe you've seen in a different classroom. You didn't really, never talked with them before. You're like, oh, hey, who are you? What, what, what's going on here? And they would make friendships. In, these, in those situations. Now, to be honest, a lot of times they would just be griping about Professor Henry and the horrible things he was making them do in class, right? All this reading and work, why are you doing this? And you know, as you know, there's a lot of political science research that suggests one of the great ways of binding people together is to have a common enemy, which is a role that I serve for many of my students. So uh, anyway, so that would be sort of an example. That was what it was originally going on, right? There would be discussion, there'd be dis well, you can guess what happens now when I go up. When I walk into the classroom now, everybody's staring at their phones. They don't talk with anyone. Now, for all I know, they're, they're tweeting each other with their neighbors, right? I mean, I've seen that happen too, right? I mean, heaven forbid that you talk uh, if you're, when you can just tweet it and it's, or, or uh, text instead. Well, that is a fundamental difference in terms of how we communicate. Right? And this is why, in, uh, those of us who teach in colleges, one of the things that we are actually worried about is that college students are increasingly terrified of talking to people face to face if they don't already know them. Right? This is terrifying for them. Um, and we're having to set up programs, all right, how do we help students to learn to talk to people? Right? Heaven forbid asking anyone to go out on a date. Right? Dates are unheard of. Right? Who does that anymore? Why? Well, I mean, you've got to like, talk to people and stuff. Right? I mean, it's horrifying. You never know what might happen. She might say no. He might say no, whatever. That is a major change in how we communicate. Right? And connected with that is also then how technology changes how we view the other person. So for example, um, there are a lot of, of especially young men who are engaging in, um, in a lot of internet activity that is, to say the least, not helpful. Um, so that's where you see this in particular is going to be in situations like um, in a lot of hardcore gaming and, quite frankly, pornography. Pornography is actually changing how me many men interact with women. You might have heard about something called the, the rape uh, crisis that's happening on campus. It doesn't actually mean what you think it means. What's actually happening is that a lot of men are increasingly seeing, or at least this is what, we're, what appears to be happening, a lot of men are increasingly watching really, really aggressive, nasty uh, pornography on the internet, and they think that's normal sexual behavior. And so then you basically have these, these hookups 
leading to one woman, the woman thinking that this is going to go one way, and all of a sudden it is going in a very, very different direction, right? Not, this, is, this is a church setting, and sorry, I uh, shouldn't have mentioned that here. Anyway, it's a super big deal, right? And the reason it's a big deal is because that technology has changed how some men view all women, right? And this is causing a huge crisis on college campuses. This is what a lot of these rape uh, situations are, right? It's a huge issue. And I teach law. It's a really, really complicated issue in terms of law. So it's very, so what does that mean? It means that this technology has created opportunities for us to change how we view the other. Does that make sense? All right, so that's at a very basic level. Now what happens when we begin taking that next step into the realms of, I mean, you know, they're talking now about like, uh, in porn, it's like VR, the virtual reality world, right? I mean, uh, pornography, I guess, has always been on the cutting edge of technology. What happens when we all can live in a matrix type scenario? When the virtual world, my second life, suddenly becomes more real to me than my actual life. And you, guys, you, you guys are familiar with that, right? What happens when my profile is the only part of me that I think matters, as opposed to the person next door to me, right? What that person sees. And that's one of the problems that we are running to on campus. How do you get people interacting? Why? Well, if all of a sudden I'm playing video games, that video game structures how I'm oftentimes viewing the world, how I view other people. The same thing starts to bleed into my normal world. Does that make sense? In many ways, sort of all I'm doing is talking about how some of these older issues that we began to deal with are sort of popping up anew, right? The principles remain the same, right? The principle is that God made us, and therefore we have inherent dignity. The question is, well, what does that look like in our, in our world today? And the answer is, there are very strange questions that we're having to answer right now. Right? I'm a political theorist, so I get to have the easy way out. I just present the problems. I say, boy, these are big issues. I hope somebody's thinking about them. And then I go home. Uh, there are, here, of course, you have Microsoft employees who are on the cutting edge of this stuff. Right? You have the opportunity to actually have serious conversations about what these technologies mean in light of the underlying principles and the application in this time period. Does that make sense? This is, I mean, I, this is one of the, the you know, in the book of Esther, there's, a, uh, there's this great quote I love where um, Esther is complaining. She doesn't want to go to the king and, uh, to save her people. And, and she's told, she's told uh, perhaps you were made for this time or for in this place. Right? It's just one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite passages uh, in, that, in that book. Well, I think you could basically make an argument this may be one of the gifts that God has given this parish in particular. Right? You, and, and actually Seattle in general. Which is to say this is one of the big issues we are facing. How is artificial intelligence, how is technology changing the way we think about the human person? And that is a fundamental issue at the heart of Catholic social teaching. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, it's, it's sort of, in many ways, I'm just sort of saying that if you don't show up for the next uh, meeting, you're sitting against God, but, um, but I'm not quite going to go that far. Uh, it's a super big issue. Okay, does that make sense for everyone so far in terms of sort of, sort of what that looks like? So you have principles. You try to apply them. That would be an example of where you see these changes happening. All right. The next issue that we see Catholic social teaching grappling with today, as we've already said, is going to be the environment, particularly in terms of an appreciation of sort of the network ability, the network connections. Um, we previously oftentimes would think, well, you could fix, you could do a change in this one part of the geographic region, and it was viewed as sort of, you know, a standalone thing. Well, this was just what I did. It was fine. Turns out that, especially in complicated uh, topographies, that has a bigger impact, right? You could get rid of wetlands, that could have an impact on the whole region. Turns out it's just more complicated uh, than we oftentimes thought. So what does that mean, right? That's also a big area that we begin to see Catholic social teaching begin to look at. The idea is that we are to be stewards, yes, but we are also part of this natural environment, which means that we need to pri prioritize, or at least in some way grapple with, the best way to do environmental stewardship. Um, so, to, you know, I, should, I just realized I should pull my phone out because I have no idea what time it is. Um, and I know I'm supposed to give some time for questions. I'm sorry? 
Seven? Okay, it's seven o'clock. I think I'm supposed to, when am I supposed to start uh, shutting up? I can go on forever. Um, so when do, I, when do I shut up and take questions? 7.15? I stop at 7.15? Okay, good. All right, so let's talk about, what I'll, let's talk about, so we've talked about environmentalism, we've talked about, um, uh, talk about, let's move on to social issues. The social issues are an issue that obviously was a big deal in Pope John Paul II's uh, papacy, and it remains, it continues to be a big issue. Uh, abortion, of course, is a huge issue with, for all Catholic social teaching, but you should know that really the, the big issue that's now starting to pop up is actually more euthanasia. Um, abortion is still a huge issue. Um, it still remains to be a big issue. What's new, I think, in our time period is an increasing growth in euthanasia. And you see this already happening in Europe. And, I'm gonna, and I'll just let you know, in my opinion, you're going to see this start to roll out here in the U.S. There are very basic economic reasons for this. Um, uh, the West is like, America is just like the rest of the West in having largely underfunded their uh, Social Security and Medicare programs, right? And I'd be happy to talk about the economic issues of that behind that one. But there are basically major economic issues coming down the road in terms of how in the world we fund these programs. Well, the easiest way to fund these programs is to kill off everybody who's on them, right? Which is what you're already starting to see. Um, sort of pop up, especially in some of the European countries' medical systems, right? And so just so you know, this is going to be, it's, uh, you're starting to see, wh what's the term that's used for this? Uh, involuntary euthanasia, that's I think the term that's used for this. In other words, you're starting to see now people who are being euthanized despite, having not, despite not having said they want to be. Now that's what we used to call murder, right? Um, but now it's viewed as a medically appropriate way of dealing with this because it resolves long-term economic issues. That's going to be a super big issue going ahead. Related to this then, the next issue you're seeing is going to be some of the issues regarding um, genetic manipulation. Uh, this is a really big issue and extremely complicated, right? On the one hand, what do you do with genetic disabilities? So for example, I wear hearing aids. Um, my, my son, my five-year-old son, is now wearing hearing aids. It's widely assumed that's genetically caused, right? We'll find out more later. But there's a history of hearing loss in my family, and without hearing aids, I don't hear anything. This is, a, this is actually a huge issue for my mom, because uh, I'm a huge reader. I've always been a huge reader. And my mom, I was one of six kids, and so my mom, who also she homeschooled, so I was the oldest, so there were rules. The rule was, oldest son's supposed to do things, right? Well, I didn't want to do things, right? I was a selfish little kid, I wanted to read. Turns out a really easy way to not officially get in trouble is to take your hearing aids out. Because if you can't hear your mom, then you didn't officially disobey her, which is totally what I would say. I didn't disobey you, mom, just totally didn't hear you. Which is why, about the age of six, I then, there was a new rule established in the Henry household. The new rule was nobody is allowed to take their hearing aids off in this household until they go to bed, right? So genetic causation. If I had the ability, right, to say, well, when, when my son was in utero, perhaps you could have flipped, done genetic uh, manipulation in some way to have removed that hearing loss from being passed on. What does that mean? And this is a super big issue because, you know, we don't know a whole lot about what happens with genetic manipulation. Perhaps the hearing lo would be lost, but his spark of joy that he has, he's so much fun to be around, might, might be changed. His emotional characteristics might be changed. We don't know, right? But that's just the first stage of the question. Here's where it gets really interesting. What happens if we find out a way to genetically increase the IQ of a fetus in utero? And that become, that presents a ton of questions for Catholic social teaching, right? You begin to ask about the nature of human nature. What does that mean if we begin to think of creating human nature as opposed to seeing each child as a gift from God, right? Um, it also leads to huge issues of inequity. What happens if it turns out that the only people who are smart enough to get the high paying jobs are the ones whose parents had enough money to pay for these things, right? Huge questions that are, that are looking down the road, right? And again, these are the questions that Catholic social teaching asks. We Americans have an instinctive desire to go technology first. And look, I only hear you because of my hearing aids. Obviously, this is something that I'm a huge fan of, right? But the Catholic tradition has always stressed that technology can also be very dangerous, right? 
And this is particularly case, the, the case when in terms of genetic. Just in terms of genetic, um, when, when you change genetics, one of the big concerns that especially the Vatican has, has had is that it's not just changes that would happen to that individual, it would pass down the, the future generations, which means this is a super big deal, super big thing to look at. What does that mean for Catholic social teaching? That's going to be another really big question to look at. All right, does that make sense so far? So those are some of the new issues I think we're starting to, to deal with. Okay, the next uh, two more practical issues that Catholic social teaching has to, do, to, to deal with, and then I'll sort of talk about um, how I would try to approach Catholic social teaching. Um, uh, immigration, I've talked, mentioned earlier, immigration is a super big topic, right? It's, it's in the political news. Um, from a Catholic social teaching, I think you can make an argument on both sides, and this is actually what I'm gonna argue um, in the future. Um, the Catholic social teaching, as the bishops have stressed, are very strong in terms of saying you don't get to treat um, other uh, immigrants as though they are not the children of God, right? That's just not allowed, right? So there is this deep appreciation, and you see this in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You also see arguments in terms of the political culture, the importance of the community, right? The importance of, the nat of your nationality that you also see in the Old and New Testaments as well. It's complicated, right? Um, the second thing that, you tend, that, you, that you're going to see the bishops talking about this is in terms of tax policies, right? How high should the taxation rate be? And then how much social spending should we be doing? Now, what I want to basically conclude with the, my last remaining, um, uh, uh, the rest of my time, is basically give you what I'm beginning to think is sort of the, the way, the role that Catholic social teaching plays. Remember, we have principles. The question, the tricky part, is always how do you apply those principles, right? I think Catholic social teaching, the real strength of Catholic social teaching, is that it can provide a common language for people who are across the political spectrum to discuss things, right? So, for example, when do you stress subsidiarity? When do you stress solidarity? The language is there. It's not clear to me that the, in many cases the, po the politics that are involved are very complicated. And you can actually make, in, many case, in some cases anyway, legitimate Catholic social teaching arguments on both sides of these positions. Does that make sense? In other words, it's not clear to me that we oftentimes want to look to Catholic social teaching as providing the answer, which just always happens to agree with what my political opinion is, and then I use that to hit everybody over the head with it, right? That's how everybody uses Catholic social teaching. That's not actually, I think, the way it's intended to be used. Catholic social teaching is basically introducing you to thinking about the human person and then sort of giving you a language to grapple with applying these principles to specific situations. The thing is, doing that is complicated. Politics is always complicated because we human beings are very complicated, right? And it's not to say that you're always going to come to conclusions, right? Uh, I'm very political, and in my, in my parish, we have people who, are, who disagree with me on almost every political uh, position. We have a lot of fun debating, because I love to debate. Um, but we also do it within the same construct, which means that we use the same language and we understand the other's position as still being an appropriate position for a Catholic to take. Does that make sense? And I think a lot of times, especially in today's hyper-polarized world, where increasingly God is on my side and everybody else is going to hell, right? I'm not going to talk to the other side. Now, there are big political reasons for why you have that polarization, which I could talk about if you want to later. But that is a huge issue right now. How do you get people talking across the divide? I think the answer, one of the answers anyway, would be at a deeper appreciation of Catholic social teaching that allows us to interact meaningfully with those with whom we would disagree, recognizing that oftentimes they also have good things at heart. You may disagree with them on the, prince, on the application, but you can still agree on the principle. Or to put it differently, you can vote differently in the ballot box, but you can still line up together to take the Eucharist together. So that's sort of, I think, the, the long-term, sort of the short-term crisis in American politics. I think it can play a role, I think, for helping us to resolve our huge disagreements. All right, does that make sense? Um, 
what I'll say is, for depending on, uh, I'll open this up for questions on the idea that whatever you want to go with, uh, I'll go. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer any questions. My general rule is I'll, I'll at least answer the questions for students, um, and I'll go into as many details as you would like to go to. Um, I love political philosophy, I love economics, and I love political science, and I love theology. That's pretty much all I studied my whole life. So anything you want to talk about, literature too, Dante, don't get me started. Uh, whatever you guys want to talk about, I'm good to go. Finding, I'm sorry. The truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. And we were always raised to have a love for our conscience, mm -hmm. but more and more, it's, I believe, now we're trying to find a well informed opinion. Mm -hmm. right. right. And this is a struggle that I have because there's only so much time in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can, you can spend hours on end trying to find the truth of the matter in right. any political matters. Right. But at some point, you kind of have to stop and just be like, I, I think I have it. Right. And I'm going to make my opinions and make my choices accordingly. Right. And so I'm really curious what your opinion is about what our obligation is. Because our moral obligation, sorry, our moral obligation is to find kind of, if we disagree, to dissent. Right. But dissent and then still pursue. And so that's where I'm, we just watch, you know, CNN, Fox News, whatever, and right. just take it as it is. Right. I don't believe right. we're meeting our modern day obligation. Right. Yeah. So what would your advice be to this? That is a really good question. Um, let me start. So my dad, uh, I'm, a, I'm a convert uh, to Catholicism. My dad was a pastor. And uh, he was an incredibly, um, an incredibly um, just I deeply, deeply respect him. Um, he died many, many years ago, but I deeply respect him. Um, one of his principles of life, uh, I think, is how the first part of the, the answer to your question. Um, he would have people come to him and say, you know what, I, had, I made this decision after praying, and I look back five to 10 years later, and it was the wrong decision, right? I made this life choice, I decided to take this career, and I look back and it was the wrong decision. What do I do with that? And my dad's principle was that God always expects you to make a decision with the information that you have at that time. And so he used that in terms of like our personal, like looking back at our life choices and thinking, what do I do with the fact that I should have gone this route instead of that route, right? How do I resolve that? So his first thing is to say, you always have to be willing to say, God gave me, I, 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 was, I did my duty in pursuing the knowledge that I could get, but when I look back, what happens if I made the mistake? You just say, you know what, that was what, I did what I could, and now I learn and I move on. Because otherwise you end up with the Hamlet curse, right? Where you just end up just sort of always debating and never doing. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is to say that we are in a huge, the problem that you're describing is basically a problem of, it's a media problem, right? Which is to say that the, right now the media is, is um, financially incentivized to give clickbait as opposed to serious stories, right? That's, that's the whole structure is that way. And so there really isn't, the New York Times, to use an example, has basically just been, they, they, they were, the, the, their editor basically just said, look, we're not gonna say certain things because our readers don't wanna hear that. Um, they're gonna change their coverage. Um, and that's, you know, cable news is notorious regardless of what you watch for doing that sort of thing. So part of the problem is that the traditional model of media has radically changed. And I'm a political scientist, and so I get to say that this is my job. And so I get to read, like, I read across the sections for everything, right? Um, I read across the perspectives, and then I sort of try to get a sense of it. Um, I'm not normal, <laughs> right? I mean, I get to use that as a job, right? My job is to write and publish on that so I can do that. When it comes to sort of people who are working in a non-political environment, I think the question is, well, how do you come to, how do you understand what the, the facts are, right? Um, 
the uh, stories coming out of Ukraine are a great example of that, right? Um, we're not going to know the or like to use the example the origins of the, this is what the, D the Department of Justice is looking into, right? Well, at the end of the day, everybody has their theories, but we're not going to know until Durham c comes out with his either charges or he doesn't. But that's not enough. We want to know now, and so we basically just, that's where we take agency, right? Our desire to sort of start reading the, dirty, the dirtiest gossip about whoever the bad guy is, whether it's on the right or the left, that's what's driving all of this negative coverage, right? This silly coverage that you see. Um, I'll be happy to talk off camera about ways that like journals that I use, um, <laughs> and I'll be happy to do that off, to basically give you, this is what I do with my students, where I'll basically say, look, here's a cross section of how you, I mean, the obvious thing is that what I would do is to recommend you read the editorial page of the New York Times to get a sense of mainstream left. You read the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal to, read, to get the mainstream right. And usually, if they both agree on something, then it's probably true. Now, that doesn't happen very often. Um, so, like, in terms of, like, a quick rough and ready approach, now, then you have paywalls, and then it runs into, you know, a tricky thing. But, like, the easiest way is to basically try to find one fairly reasonable news source that represents at least the mainstream left and the mainstream right and see if they agree on anything. Yeah. So I, I really, I think you're saying have patience. Yeah. A lot of this yeah. Is yeah, I mean a lot, a lot of what we want, I mean we want to know now what's not going to come out for three months, which means all the stories that we're going to read, whether it's from you know, the left or the right, are all going to be disproved regardless of what they say when the truth comes out. So to some extent it's being judicious. Sure. I think it's also being open. Mm. And it's being open, like if you do hear dissenting opinion, and mm. if you do hear dissenting facts to what you perceive at first, right. just right. take account of it yeah. and just weigh it appropriately. To some extent, this also goes to one of the problems that we have in our, in our world today, which is sort of this strange lack of inquisitiveness. Right? It used to be that if you heard something that contradicted what you thought, you would think, well, that's really interesting. I've never heard that before. What in the world's going on? Then you'd look into it like, well, that guy's crazy, you know, or maybe it's not. But there was that sense of, wait a minute, I hadn't heard that idea before. Let's go check it out. Well, nowadays we are much more insecure, I think, uh, and so as a result, we really only want to read the people who already agree with us. And at that point, you're wasting your time, right? I mean, you know, look at yourself in the mirror and tell you're doing yourself a great job, right? I mean, it's, it's pointless, right? And that's what we do with our media now. It has been reported in the media that uh, Joe Biden, who was Catholic, was presumably denied of the Eucharist because of his views on abortion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true, but that's what some of the media indicate. Mm -hmm. If it's true, if you're aware, kind of understand it. What are your thoughts on it? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> here's a little bear trap. Would you mind jumping on in? Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, what, I would say, what I would say is this. Um, this is actually a really, it's a, the canon law on this is not something that I am remotely uh, able to talk about. So uh, I follow on Twitter some people who are canon lawyers, and they were having a big debate about the proper way to interpret canon law. So in terms of the canon law on this, I'm just going to explicitly state that's outside my purview. I'm not an expert in that way. Um, I think that from what I had read, part of the difficult, when, you, when, when Biden drove up into that church, apparently the church is known for being an aggressively pro, like an outwardly pro-life parish and he had to drive past like massive pro-life signs and I think they were like they may even had like the crosses on the lawn for representing abortion like it was a really really aggressive parish and I'm not one of the questions I've always won there's always a question about whether you try to create bad news in order to get a story I don't know what's I don't know if that was the staff's position I don't think that Biden himself would have voluntarily um, gone into a situation assuming that he would be denied the Eucharist um, what I would say is this, on the one hand, there is, the church has always believed that, you know, confession is important so that you can then be prepared to use, to, 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 um, to do the, to, um, to, to take the Eucharist. On the other hand, Pope Francis has talked about the Eucharist as sort of like this field, in terms of this, like a field hospital, where we need to sort of recognize that we're trying to work with people who are basically trying to struggle to find the way. So I'm sort of basically saying those would be the two perspectives on that. In terms of whether I, would have done that? The answer is I don't have to make that decision because I'm not a priest. 
There we go. <laughs> um, I was really inspired recently by uh, reading the Benjamin Action. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Benjamin Actions and the author proposing that Catholics intentionally step away from secular society more actively and try to um, differentiate ourselves. Great question. Um, so let me give a, I have a whole class dedicated to this question. Um, so um, let me start by saying that Catholic social teaching, traditionally, one way to think of it is that they think of the, we tend to think of um, the world in a tripartite fashion. So you have the market over here, you have the governments over here, and civil society is in the middle. And Catholic um, social teaching has always stressed the importance of that civil society. Those are the things that are primarily meaningful. Right? It's not commercial transaction, although they're important. It's not the state, although that's important. The meaningfulness is found in this, in this realm. And quite frankly, Catholic social teaching has always worried because conservatives worry about, or like some, some conservatives will worry about the government intruding on civil society, but then they ignore when the marketplace does the same thing. And then it's vice versa. The progressive movement you know, worries about this, but not that. And that's why Catholics have always tried to traditional Catholics have always said, no, you're, you're both right and you're both wrong. You're both right insofar as you're worrying about the other perspective, but you're wrong because you're not worrying about your own. So I think that's, so, so in that sense, I think that's what Dreher, I mean, Dreher himself is now orthodox, but that's what Dreher is basically trying to talk about, is rebuilding this middle, rebuilding this in terms of intentional community. And I couldn't agree with him more. I mean, I think he's absolutely right about that. Um, the problem is, that neither of these two organizations on either the commercial side or on the government side are willing to leave us alone, right? I mean, it's one thing to say we need to build an intentional community. And this is true, right? I mean, you know, we all prefer our ease. We all prefer our comfort. And, you know, being involved in meaningful relationships, especially for young people now who are used to living electronically, it's, it really takes a lot out of us, right? And so that intentional community, however you want to understand that, I think is absolutely necessary. And I think it, it tends to happen naturally in churches, right? Um, Protestant churches, for example, you, see, you oftentimes will see this, the smaller churches that have really intense communities, uh, really sort of devoted to trying to help each other spiritually. Um, in my parish, we have, I think we have this. There's a lot of deep friendships that people have in an attempt to try to help everyone else, especially, well, I'm, I'm young, we have kids, so our, my networks are basically going to be a lot of other families who are all trying, you know, we're all trying to get our kids to heaven, right? So that's what we're sort of trying to get focused on. Um, so you see that, but the problem is, and this is where Dreher himself has pulled back from since writing that book, and he's tried to make clear he's not talking about withdrawal because everybody's pushing, right? The commercial side, I mean, for crying out loud, 
the apps are now basically paying psychologists to try to find out what causes addiction so that they can then use those things in their apps, right? Um, holy smokes, uh, you're talking about, and now we let, for crying out loud, we let 10-year-old kids have cell phones. I mean, don't get me started on that. Uh, it, 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 just, I, I, it is hard for me to stress strongly enough. I think that's a really bad idea uh, for all sorts of reasons. But so the commercial side is basically analyzing how the mind works in order to monetize it. Now, there are advantages to that. I mean, I'm, I like the free market, and so I actually like, again, it's, it's not all bad, it's not all good, but there are some really bad things going on. On the other side, especially if you hold to traditional Catholic understandings of sexuality and human nature, you're going to see the government get really, really aggressive, right? Um, the city of Pittsburgh has a rule where they not only don't allow Catholic charities to be involved in adoptions, if you are associated with, ca or not adoptions, foster care and adoptions, if you are associated with Catholic charities, you're not allowed to be in foster care because, you do, because your opinions on sexuality are fundamentally injurious to anyone that would be in your household. We're already seeing this in divorce cases where if one, one parent in a divorce want, believes in traditional sexual and gender roles and the other one doesn't, then they're staggering the results one side over the other. So the idea that we could just pull back and, and not pay attention to politics, I mean, and Dreher himself is saying, look, that's not what I'm arguing. And I agree, I don't think it's about ignoring. Right, right. right. I don't think it's about ignoring politics, but um, my, it, it would be irresponsible to ignore politics. Right. Because right, right, right. Right. Referring back to the master, even if he, you know, he just was aware of civil society and the Roman Empire, and like mm -hmm. he, he had a wisdom about that. But right. um, for us in our time, my concern is that it's too easy for us to be completely, you know, drawn into the surface and lose mm -hmm. ourselves, yeah. and not yeah. have a solid Christian community right. to draw to return to it in the evening, as it were, you know, right, right. where in you look at traditional Christianity, especially in the first few centuries, it was heavily persecuted, those people were active in the same world, but they had each other and they right. knew who they were. So right, right. I just wonder if that's even possible for us now to really remember like our priorities in that sense. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think that to the extent, so the church has been trying to do this new evangelism for a while. And, you know, we've had some, some public relations fiascos over the past several decades, which has not been beneficial for this evangelism. To the extent that we have it, I think that's going to be where, where you see it. It's basically an intentional community of people who are living differently and priorita prioritizing things differently. Um, you know, not buying, you know, whatever it might be. And it's going to look different for each family and, and different, each community. I think you're, you're right, in sen I think, in saying that the only way we're going to survive this is going to be through intentional community. Um, if you like the first, like if you're doing risk, if you're playing war, right? The easiest way to divide, you divide and conquer. You split everyone up, and then you can attack everyone singly. Um, the only way we're going to sort of make it, the, the church says, you don't make it to heaven on your own. You make it with the church. Well, the same thing is going to be true in terms of happiness. And I think what I would say is that looking as I look out at the world, I think what strikes me is how deeply unhappy most people are. Um, and I think that's because a Catholic social teaching would say that we are made to be in relationship, right? This goes back to the Trinity, right? God himself is in communion with himself. And so if we are to become, as the Orthodox would say, more godlike, then that means that we are going to be relationally uh, engaged. If you don't have that relational engagement, that means you are necessarily going to become unhappy. And so the question is, how do we resolve that? Well. I think the Catholic answer is to say, well, the, the, the immediate ma American answer is to say you either take a pill or you find some way to immediately get a high to resolve that. You know, you have an experience or you, you do drugs, whatever the case might be. Well, the Catholic answer is to say, it's not to downplay the importance of drugs in some scenarios, but it's to say the primary way you do this is through relationship where you then build out your own meaning. You're not just a worker. You, you become a, a husband, a wife, a, a father, an aunt, an uncle, a friend. And that's where you become more, you have more meaningful lives. Now, where this gets particularly tricky is in city development. Um, and this is one of the reasons why it's, I'm not, I'm still unsure. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, in, in Seattle, for various reasons, 
congestion is just nasty nasty now partially that's because the city's creating it but i'm talking about talk that offline but what that means is that increasingly it's difficult to get from your house to a fellow parishioner's house right um that is really difficult especially if you have kids because all of a sudden like well how am i getting them back for sleepy time right what does that mean so part of this is a failure of, of, of planning, a failure of vision by political leaders to appreciate the role of community. My own, like the, I think the ideal scenario would be one where basically you do have a church that's large enough where you can have people in smaller groups and you begin to see like the Protestants have had these small group things for a while where you get to sort of interact with people, especially for people, for those who are just entering into a church without friends that, I think, could be a way of trying to at least start a sense of intentional community. Um, having said that, it's also worth noting that intentional community, like everything else, can be taken too far, right? Um, the places that have the most intentional community are the cults, because they are completely opposed to everything else in the world. They are themselves. And, you, and I have seen scenarios, situations where churches have gone too far in terms of where intentional community is used to basically squelch. Uh, individual persons and personality. Um, however, that's not a problem most of the church has today, I think. So in that sense, I, I completely agree with you. If we're going to survive, we have to fight in the commercial and in the political arena, but we're only going to live if we, if we survive in that intentional civil society world. I think that's absolutely right. Maybe one more question. And I'll be happy to stick around if anyone wants to just talk off, talk offline. Okay, so how about we take one more formal question and address, uh, we could just address uh, informal and secondary. All right. So, um, I would like to talk about the next generation of this aspect of technology These are kind of tools, means, platforms, and inherently they can't be evil. Mm -hmm. They're just objects. It's people that make the good and bad. Yeah, right. And so I'm kind of curious when you say, for example, the internet, it gave the ability to expediently distribute pornography, mm -hmm. and then it made the choice a lot easier for people to overcome that access. And so I think what technology has done over the years is it's made a lot of our poor decisions easier. Right. Absolutely. To occur. So I'm kind of curious, what is the concern? Is the concern with AI that now we'll have non-human systems making decisions? Mm -hmm. What is the generic concern from the church? I'll do the AI. So the super big concern the dream for some AI people has always been the ability to download brains into, like this is like the, this is what the Wall Street Journal writes, right? The idea that you could create a mainframe that could basically allow you to effectively have a, uh, a mimicry of you that would live forever. Um, there are huge issues that come up with if anything remotely like that happens because at that point you end up with a mimicry of yourself living forever continuously obtaining knowledge and wisdom which means that then human beings are always going to be vastly inferior because we're born as children and we can only learn as much as we learn in 100 years. So there are like some really big political questions that play out in that regard. I think that the bigger issue is going to be um, as we begin to see more lifelike, like the, the more, not the bigger issue, the more short-term issue is going to be as we see robots engage in more appearing more like human beings then the question is, does that now lead to me treating you similar to how I treated that robot because that robot is just as meaningful to me? So for example, right, the old line, you know, Seattle, you know, nobody has children, everybody has dogs. I have a dog, right, so we have, I love dogs, but, um, but there are some who then interact with their dogs and can e easily see their dogs as fundamentally equal to a human being in terms of personhood. That's problematic. I think, from Catholic social teaching. Well, that tendency could then be seen to get even more extreme if now you have what looks exactly like a human being, right, has been created to look like a human being with a robot that is only servicing all of your basis desires. 
all of a sudden now, you know, this, I treat this, uh, this robot like crap who looks an awful lot like you. In my mind, it could become very easy. But, but anthropomorphism, right? I mean, we, we see this across the board. This is why I have some, lots of issues with, well, I don't want to talk about movies. Um, we, we do that with dogs, with animals, with plants. Right? I mean, when, when Bambi came out, right, suddenly hunting plummeted because nobody wanted to be the guy that killed Bambi's parents, right? Um, well, if that's what we're doing with animals and plants, it seems to me that this is going to create really big issues when you're looking at what appears to be a fully, like a human being who just happens to only do exactly what I want. And if you know anything, I mean, you guys all know, that's not how marriage works, right? Marriage doesn't work, or at least it's not supposed to work, with one person always demanding and the other one always giving, right? Marriage is reflecting the trinity, where you have giving and where there are strengths and different strengths that allow you to come together to make a unified whole. Well, if we have young children from their childhood with robots that are very efficiently operating or allowing their basis desires to work or to become effective, it seems to me very problematic that they're, or very difficult for them to then actually interact meaningfully with a spouse who doesn't do that. That, I think, in the short term is going to be the big issue I think we're going to have, which isn't the super big issue, but it's going to be the short term issue, I think. So. All right, well, I think that's the last question, so thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.